Yeah. Thank you very much for the invitation here and for uh, hosting us here in this nice place. Uh, my name is Mateusz Pusz. I came to you from Poland. Actually, I am on vacations right now <laughs> with my family. So, yeah, this is a short introduction about me. Uh, a few people call me uh, C++ evangelists, oh, mostly people that, that know me, uh, my friends. And uh, being here on the vacations probably means that exactly, that wherever I, where, wherever I am, I'm trying to spread C++ knowledge to the people and experience. So uh, actually, this is we have time until 10 p.m. as we've heard, but this is your time. It's also my time, but it's mostly your time. So you should take benefit from it as much as you can. So please be active. Please ask questions. Please discuss stuff here. I, it's not, I, do, I would like just to provide a monologue because otherwise you could just listen to me on the YouTube channel. It's a meetup, yes? So let's discuss stuff. Uh, I'm doing C++ for living for more than 15 years right now. I'm working for commercial software and I'm also working on open source part of it. Uh, through all of these years, I've really been on different places and different seats in different companies. I started as a validation lead, as a, then as a senior there. But actually, I was never doing like manual tests or something like this, but always I was scoping on creating validation tools with, for example, real-time constraints. So, so those tools were really yeah, needed for, for some, especially 3G and, and WiMAX technologies, where everything has to be synced to the frame. Uh, after that, I was uh, always doing development and I was the security uh, champion and at Intel company. And then I started to be an architect for products, for solutions, for uh, software and so on. Besides, probably some of you probably know me from C++ conferences when I try to appear. I'm also a, C++ a member of the IC++ committee, uh, representing actually Polish and US national bodies. But I cannot rise to hands actually during voting, so that's sad. And yeah, probably that's, that's most about me. And from the ICL committee, I'm the most interested in the study group 14, which is responsible for high performance and low latency stuff. And study group 20, that actually was, whole, was created like last year, a study group responsible for the education stuff. So we are trying to approach universities and, and some, some trainings done by other trainers in order to provide higher quality engineers coming to, to work for interviews. So we want to update curricula on, on the universities and, and, and work with the teachers in order to um, influence them somehow to teach things that are actually modern. <coughs> then it sometimes happens differently. <coughs> uh, yeah, I'm a trainer. So basically I'm doing this for living for many years right now, but uh, as it started to be more common, uh, people started to come to me and say, Mateusz, can you provide me a training? I always said yes. So at, at some point I said I have to like make it official. So I created a company called Trainity for this. And yeah, I already said I was working at Intel for 13 years. Right now I'm leading the C++ Competency Center at EPAM Systems. This is an outsourcing company. We are doing products for, for different companies. So maybe either you worked already with IPAM or if you are looking for, for outsourcing stuff, you can contact me or someone else from my company. Um, yeah, so I spoke about, about, about this one and yeah, seven years ago I won BrainBench. I, I don't know if you know something called BrainBench. This is a certification site on, on C++ knowledge. Uh, some time ago they created worldwide uh, com uh, com like competition for C++ knowledge and actually I was lucky enough to win it but it was a long time ago um, so yeah what is C++ probably you know about it but it's not C with classes it's not C it was never actually C with classes uh, from the standardization point of view but a lot of people were treating this like this or are treating this right now oh especially talking about universities so this is something we would like to change C++ is a generic, generic programming language, so it means that you can actually choose the style and features you would like to work with. You can either work with the imperative way, but you can also work in a declarative way. Uh, you can do generic programming or object-oriented stuff. C++ is not an object-oriented language. Yes, it's only one of the approaches that actually we can use there. 
and actually we are trying to use less and less of the objects especially the like inheritance polymorphism and all of this stuff it's really slow and that's not why this language still is useful on the market and actually why it's useful on the market because it's the fastest language in the world if done properly uh, it's really hard to beat it on large scale uh, because maybe you will be able to produce a snippet in, a spe in some specific language that maybe will beat it for the specific use case but talking about the large scale software C++ is pr probably the fastest one if done correctly so basically our motto is that you don't pay for what we are not using yes it's mostly true for most of the features there are some really important uh, exceptions from this rule for example don't use shared pointer if you are using it it's, it's wrong uh, but mostly we are trying to, to not you make you pay for things that you are not using and that's why this, so, so this, this is really really good performant language talking about performance I don't mean only the like uh, runtime um, um, performance of course I don't mean compile time performance because yeah we have a lot of a lot, lot to learn here still so that's not the fastest compilation language but actually talking about the runtime is only one part of the story performance is also things like low power that is really useful for many things like small factor stuff like like your cell phones and also large scale like I don't know Facebook Amazon large farms of servers yes and also talking performance is also about memory usage if the less memory you can use the better and the more you can control it the better for the CPU caches coherency for example so uh, I'm mostly trying to be sp specializing and talking about modern C++ Modern C++ is not about using the latest C++ language version, like 17 or 20 right now. Probably a bit of it is true, but, but not only. I always say that modern C++ is a state of mind. It's the way you should think about the language and, and how it works. It's more important to understand the rules of the language rather than to know, to know its features. Because if you know the rules, you can learn the features really quickly. So what it means to, to write something in modern C++? First of all, it's only a subset of a subset of the features we have in the language. It's not about everything, especially not about pointers and other stuff. This is C, and we are paying a lot for C mm, compatibility. When people ask me what is my best and, and worst feature of the language, I say that the, worst, the best one is that we were able to, to, to appear on the market, and that's because we were compatible with C. For example, that's why probably D or other experimental languages will never be as successful as C++ is right now, because they are not compatible with, with anything else. What is the best, the worst feature of the language? We are still compatible with C. <laughs> <laughs> and this is, a, this is an issue. Um, another thing about modern C++ is that we should always be implementing the code with the uh, with performance in mind. Uh, you should think about the performance and by that I don't mean that you should micro optimize from the very beginning because that's wrong but if you do something really bad at the very beginning if you will choose like really bad data layout in the memory it's really hard to refactor that later, later on and you will probably never be able to do it later on so just don't do stupid things think about data think, think about how it's being uh, laid out in the memory I choose good containers for it of, of course you can always then refactor the containers it's pretty easy but still you have to think about the data layout it's really about performance yeah so modern C++ is also about guidelines policies idioms uh, it's really hard to learn them because there are no good books about it a gang of four patterns are not idioms I'm mentioning here yes gang of four patterns are actually the anti-patterns in C++ because most of them are based on polymorphism and inheritance of everything that's really slow and, and something that shouldn't be actually used in C++. I'm thinking about the modern C++ design things so like know what empty base optimization for example is, what is a curiously recurring template pattern. Things like this are really important. Actually you have some dedicated trainings on, on, on only on this chapter because it's really important to know that when you are designing your like I, would, I don't want to say library because people say we are not doing library, library code in corporations. I would say tool sets for everyday use. And when doing this, it's much better. And of course, 
this is the last point, last but not least. Of course, using the latest version of the language helps you to be modern. But that's not because it's just the latest one. It's just we strive for many years right now in the committee in order to make this language much more secure, much easier to use, and much more robust for you to implement the code. So there are features that help you write the code faster, safer, and, and easier right now in the modern C++ and the latest versions. So, so that's why you should always strive to go to the latest versions. Actually, a, l a large part of the talk today is talking about how your code evolves with uh, following C++ versions. Uh, Björn Strostrup, the author of the language, said a long time ago that there is a much smaller language, cleaner language within C++ struggling to get out. He actually meant the modern C++ or C++11 and at that point, yes? So this is a subset of the language, something that you can actually make C++ fun to use and, and easy to use and secure and you don't have to pay all the, all the, all the time and pay the attention to what we are doing right now, all, all the time about memory, about resources. You can just forget about it. Other languages are having things like garbage collectors, uh, which actually make developers not think at all about the memory. And still then they, have, they can have like null pointer like exception, yes. So it's not bulletproof. So they always have to think about memory anyway. But memory is not the only resource. If I leak like even one megabyte of memory, I, I have a lot of memory, it's not a problem for me. But if I will leak one locked mutex or one open file handle, and then I want to reuse that resource, it's a pain. And for that, we don't have garbage collectors in other languages. C++ can handle all of this in the same similar way using idioms. That, that, that we probably know here, yes, because Array AI is <coughs> probably the most important idiom you, you should learn as a modern C++ programmer. So this is about modern C++, this is how it works. And C++11 started to go in this path to, to, to provide us the features to work with in modern C++ way. I'm pretty sure that at least most of you here can use C++11 right now in production, so I will not like ask you to provide me show of hands. But uh, let's at least try to think uh, or talk a, a moment about this version. So uh, C++11 was a game, play, game changer on the market. We uh, got a lot of new features that were like groundbreaking at this point. Uh, we got uh, runtime imp improvements with, with move semantics, with constant expressions. We got the uh, usability improvements, we got lambdas, we got some, some uh, uh, initialization of objects, some, uh, improved uh, explicit and final overrides. Explicit is really, really yeah, important, especially if, if, if you are still using polymorphism. Uh, Range-based for loops, so things that, that actually help you with the, with the, perf with the uh, safety of your code and other features. Uh, talking about the functionality, we have variety templates that make writing uh, templates a lot of fun. And uh, multitasking memory models. So actually C++ started to talk about threads in the specification because before that there was no word thread mentioned in the paper. Actually, right now we know that there can be more than one thread of execution and that's good. Uh, we can delete default our member functions, which is really nice. We have static assertions and we have a lot of improvements to the standard library. Actually, from C++11, we stopped, from C++11, we stopped to say about uh, STL. We don't say STL anymore in the committee. We, t we say always about standard library because it's much more about just uh, templates and, and, and containers, algorithms and iterators right now. So we have threading facilities, we have smart pointers, we have type traits, we have tools for specific domains like chrono, like, like uh, randomization stuff, um, regex for strings and so on. But C++11 was only the beginning of the changes. It was groundbreaking uh, for the industry. A lot of people, a lot of companies awake with this version. So this is actually the graph of how C++ language evolves uh, by the measure of ICC++ committee, which is work group 21. And this is actually the graph of number of attendees attending every meeting, uh, our working meeting in the IC committee, and number of papers we have to um, process during each meeting. You can see that until C++11, it was nearly flat. 
about 50 persons were attending all of every meeting. So this was a small group of people that everybody knew each, each other. Uh, there was like 20 to 60 papers on each meeting to, to process in average. So it was not that, that big, but it was constant. And that's why we have C++ 11. But after that, the market awake. And, and, and a lot of good things happen. We, we observe much more people attending our meetings. Right now it's nearly 200. And we have a lot of papers coming in. Papers uh, are the proposals for change to language. Because ICT Plus committee actually doesn't create the language. We are not at the authors of the language. ICT Plus committee is actually code review. So really boring stuff, yes? We, we get papers from the community and we are reviewing, providing feedback. So are, are, either we are accepting the feature as it is, or we are asking for more feedback, or just saying, don't bother, it doesn't have sense. But, but we are not doing this too, too often. But sometimes it's easier to just say someone that, that it's better for him to spend his efforts on something else. But it's not being too often, as I said. So actually, on last meetings, we have more, nearly 300 of papers coming in on every meetings. And that means that when someone counted the pages of, of papers we have to read, even excluding the standard document itself, it was more pages that William Shakespeare wrote through all of the, his life. So when we are coming to every meeting three times a year, we should read Shakespeare, all of books for each meeting right now in order to be pre pre prepared, yes? Because this was the expectation for the committee member that he, when he is coming to a meeting, he should be already knowledgeable about the papers we'll be processing on the meeting in order to make it faster. Right now, probably it, no one is able to read all of this stuff. That's why we are trying to parallelize ourselves or fork ourselves, if it's possible. So this is how the committee is being structured. At the very beginning, it was only one layer. It was WG21 ISIS Plus Committee and all those 50 persons were sitting in one room and talking about the language. But it was not productive after a while. So we started to, to parallelize in two different streams for the core language and for the library. But again, it didn't scale. So we started to add layers here. We have layers for so-called evolution groups, which means that these are the groups that are first um, feedback group, group that gets the paper and it has to agree if specific feature has sense or doesn't have sense for the, for the language. Provide, provide the feedback to the, to the author and, and if or, and accept it for specific language version. And if it's accepted, then it goes to wording groups that actually uh, verify if the paper wording is specified in a way that it's easy to implement and everyone knows how to implement this in the same way. After that, we, it comes to the committee meeting on Saturday where we have voting on, 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 the, on the feature. So this is the pipeline. The papers, come from the community, not from the ICC++ committee. The words are similar, but this is a big difference here. Community are actually all of us here in this room. Every one of you can be a paper author. If you have any idea and just know, don't know how to start, contact me or any other ICC++ committee member. There is Andreas. You can ask him. <laughs> you know him already. So we will help you to write the paper. If you have a great idea, we are looking for those, yes? And um, besides committees, co community and individual contributors, we have so-called study groups. Study groups are the groups that are, that are the, let's say, uh, working groups of experts on specific domain. So uh, we have groups on the game dev and low latency. We have groups on undefined behavior concurrency. Probably this one is the, the most active one. Machine learning was created lately and all of other interesting topics here. So um, those experts gather together and try to create some papers for specific domain uh, for the bigger papers in most, ca in most cases for, for the language. And actually, even with that, it didn't scale too well. So we added new study groups here, 17 and 18. These are so-called incubators. Those are study groups that are mm, uh, scheduled in the process just before the evolution groups. So they can provide early feedback to the authors before the evolution groups can look into it. For example, for last three meetings, we were scoping on C++ 20 to close it. But those groups started already to, to provide the feedback to the authors for C++ 23 features. 
so the authors could, can provide beta papers when the evolution groups are ready to, to start with them. So this is basically how the process works. And this is the outcome of the process. As you can see, for C++11, we are working heavily to finalize this version, and we are working on, let's say, on the trunk of our repository. And it's really hard to ship anything if you are working on the trunk all of the, all of the time, yes? Because if one branch, one, one feature is stable, another one was just merged in, yes? And it's really hard to ship anything at, 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 at the, in, the, in that way. That's why we're waiting so long for, for, for C++11 to come. And after that, C++ committee decided that we should start being agile and, and provide features in, and releases in every three years. So this is our, uh, let's say, sprint, three year sprint for our software. But assuming that we meet only or work only three weeks in a, in a year, it starts to have sense, yes? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, so we have C++ 14, 17 and 20. And you can see that we started to parallelize our work. We started to work on branches for specific domains. These are features, file system, leap fundamentals, parallelize, concepts, ranges, modules, coroutines. And we are merging those features wh wherever they are ready. Technical specification, is also an official ICO document. It may be not that strong standard as the IS for, specific for C++, but those are official papers. So if they are released, published, you can start working with them and, and actually compiler vendors should start implementing them. But yeah, the reality is a bit uh, different here. And not many of them are implemented actually. But some of them are library only stuff, so we can start working with them already. And it's C++20. C++20 is closed right now. We will not accept any new features to C++20. It, right now we are just providing, uh, right now we'll be uh, fixing comments that came to us about a current feature. So we got the review by the uh, national bodies all over the world. And we try to address those, those issues and then release the version. So it means that actually Evolution Group will, ha will have a lot of fun soon because we'll start working on C++23 with new features like pattern matching, like static exceptions for language. There's a lot of cool stuff going for C++23. And of course, things like reflections. So why do we need so many changes? Uh, people, when they're coming to them as a C++ trainer say, we are not using or not moving from C++11 because C++11 was already pain in the ass to learn. There's a lot of features there and you are just making our life harder and more miserable because you have to learn more, yes? You are trying to complicate the language. Uh, actually, that's not true. Uh, as you, if you look closely to the features that we are trying to release, it's not about complicating the language or making you more to learn. It's about making your life easier, safer, and allow you to develop the code faster. Because most of the features we provide is about improving your work. About some, it's about something that, that is really useful for most of you in order to pr produce the, the, the code, the product, uh, ship it faster and safer. And we'll see some of the features today during the talk. So I could basically go through C++ 14, 17, 20 right now and provide you the same, the, the same graph of the features that were in being introduced there, but you can read it on Wikipedia anyway, or you know it already. So what, what I decided to show you is that I would I selected like 10, maybe 13 or 15, I even didn't count, uh, typical engineering problems that you probably have similar in your work, in your production code. And I would like to show you how the code evolves with specific C++ version. So how it will change if you are, for example, stuck in C++ on C++11 right, right now, how your code can look if you will upgrade to the new versions. It's also some food for thought for you. If you're looking for arguments for your management, in order to, to provide to, to, to move to the newer versions, because it's actually a, there is actually quite a few good selling points in order to improve. If you're having problems with, with the upgrade, come to me and we can speak after the talk or contact me privately. I have also have some other tweaks and 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 and, and tips how you can um, like influence your management in order to to, to 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 make the change. So let's talk about the first use case here. We want to implement, uh, let's say, pushback function 
that you can provide any arguments uh, to it just to push back to the vector. So, for example, if you are initializing the unit test with pushbacks, it probably you know it because you probably written this a few times ago, uh, a few times already in your code some time ago. So you have to put, provide like 10 elements, yeah, push back, push back, push back, push back to the vector in order to initialize something with data. So let's do it in one line, yes? So until C++11, you had to do it in a simple overloady way. You did so many overloads as you were not, uh, or yeah, as, as, you, as you wanted until, until you got depressed with all of those overloads and stopped, yes? So basically you provide the overload for no arguments, for one argument, two arguments, three arguments, and probably you will be bored at 10 or 12. This, these were the typical numbers that, and that, that people stopped with those. Of course, you know what, when, I, when I'm heading to, I'm taking, heading to variable templates. So with variable templates, you provide only two, let's say overloads, those are, those are actually not overloads because uh, this is the, the template. So, so this, these are two, yeah, these are overloads actually, yeah, but this is, these are templates, so, so they will be uh, instantiated only when the arguments come here. And we have provided the end case with zero data, zero, zero implementation, and the generic case that will push forward only one element and, and then push back the, the rest of those arguments in a, let's say, template recursive way. It's not a recursion, but yeah, it looks like in the, in the template code. And with C++ 17, actually, we started to love those three dots that much that we thought about how to make it even, even better. So with C++ 17, you get things called uh, for, uh, uh, folding here. And with fold expressions, you can just expand those, those, th this ex expression here with nearly any operator in the language. So you can put plus here, multiply, or, or streaming operator, and it will just work. Uh, the benefit of it is, is pretty good because uh, the benefit of it is that the, it will compile faster and it's less code to type. Because from the runtime perspective, from binary code, you will see exactly the same code with every of those three versions of the code. You just have to type less, so you probably will make less errors in the code. And probably it will also compile faster, faster because it will be only one function template specialization for, for a specific set of parameters instead of having all those overloads being generated. But it was pretty easy. Let's think about another use case here. We want to handle time in the language in a uniform portable way. Uh, we want to implement some run until function that gets a timeout and do a, let's say, easy, busy spin for loop waiting for, for the event because we expect that the timeout will be pretty short. So we don't want to sleep here. Uh, before C11, you had to work with uh, operating, specific, operating system specific features because there was not, not possible to write a portable code. This is Linux specific stuff. Time spec is the most high resolution clock out there. So you provided some timeout as an argument to the function and then you had to uh, make nanoseconds from it. So you had to multiply it by such a strange magic number. I, maybe I will have to try to count if I don't have a bug here. Is it a three zeros, six, nine? I think it's okay, but you can check me. So, so this is basically what you have to do every time you are doing the code like this. And multiply it by seconds, of course, and plus nanoseconds. And then we are doing the, the, the spin loop, while true, we have to get a current, current time stop and once again multiply it by the same number and do the, and compare it to the timeout. If it's passed, then we are breaking, otherwise we call run. <coughs> and if you want to call this function, you have to do it one more time. So I assume this is 300 milliseconds, but I may be wrong. You can check me here again by counting the zeros. and. Um, I have to create a timestamp for, for the end and I have to get current timestamp. Uh, sorry, current timestamp was get got in the run until function here. But yeah, I have to get the current timestamp and the time of, of end. First of all, it's not portable, yes? As I said, it's not working on Windows. Second of all, it's really hard to do it. 
and, and probably you, would, you, you don't want to write the code like this. With C++11, we got Chrono. In my personal opinion, Chrono is uh, the best implemented and designed library in the standard library. So if you want to learn modern C++, I really recommend you going there and um, reviewing how it's implemented, how it's designed, because I'm pretty sure that Howard Hinnant thought a lot about it and it's actually the state of art, in my opinion. So with C++11, you just provide steady clock, time point, and timeout, and do while steady clock now is less than timeout, then run, and that's all. It's much easier and much safer, it's portable, it's great. And if you want to use it, you just provide the start is a steady clock now, and you have run until start plus minus milliseconds 300. With C++14, we got also user-defined literals, so you can type, make it even faster. But probably most of you already knew about it, how Chrono works, and you can do this stuff like this. But what about date? Let's assume that you would like to uh, know what day of the week was July 4, 2001. And right now we have a big problem, because even with C++17, because this is 98 and 17 code, because this is exactly the same code. You have to type it in a way like this. So you have to provide the array of, 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 of names with some unknown error or another uh, string here for the unknown case. And you have to fill out the Linux, once again, TM structure. And it has a lot of fields. Year is actually indexed from 1900, not from zero. And you have to remember about it. A month, it's zero indexed, but the day is not just to make it more easier to use. Uh, hours, minutes, seconds, and international standard they like saving time. But you can actually write minus one in order to make it easier. So this will means that it will be automatically deduced. And then you have to do M MK time, provide this structure with data, and verify if actually it was not an error, because you can always provide that way like uh, let's say February 30, yes? Which will never be a correct date. So in that case, we are setting just seven. Seven will, know, will mean unknown, and this is our error handling here. With C++20, there is a great new extension to the chrono coming from Howard Hinnant again. You can find it on his GitHub library, and I actually use it for three years right now in production for one of the biggest Mercata exchanges in the world. So it's production ready. It's date library from Howard Hinnant that was merged with Chrono. To do it in C++20, you just do something like this. And that's all. You provide weekday of July 4, 2001. And it's actually smart enough to work in compile time. So in a binary, you will just see a string Thursday or something like this. Of course, assuming it will provide compile time known constant expression as an argument, yes? So this is really smart, and once again, this is really cool design to, to, to learn from. And this is how language starts and, 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 and tries to be easier for you. And also, there is a new tendency in the language called declarative syntax. Things that say uh, what is being done instead of how it's being done. There are a lot of good talks on the, about the subject, and a lot of good libraries coming to, 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 to the market right now. There's a great library, for example, in Boost right now for state machines and that you can provide in declarative way all of the description of the state machine and it will create really optimized code for you. Probably you, if you will try to really hard to make it uh, handwritten, you would probably be slower than, than the one provided in declarative way. And it's really, really safe to use. <coughs> Another use case. Let's try to implement advanced algorithm by ourselves. So for advanced algorithm, we have to work with iterators. Iterators have, have, have uh, the hierarchy of them, and in standard library we have so-called tags. Those tags actually are implemented in this way, so this is actually the inheritance. So input iterator is the most generic iterator. There is forward, bidirectional, random access, and contiguous one. And with that hierarchy, it's pretty easy to make overloads in order to, to work, to do compile time dispatch for uh, generating good code for you. 
So actually, why, why I'm talking about this? Because compile time dispatch is really, really important for modern C++. I was fighting a lot with m in my previous company uh, about uh, using, for example, things like std copy instead of mem copy or mem set. Those functions are so-called uh, negative abstraction layers. It means that with adding new layers of abstractions for the users, you are providing even better performance rather than the one that user will provide or better functionality because this code will always generate the optimal and correct code for you. I've seen so many places where people were using memcopy and memset on structures. And those structures after a quarter, a year or two years, just happen to, to have structs like inside like strings, vectors and other stuff and it's still compiled fine. Yes, <coughs> because you can always memcopy a vector, but it's not a good idea to do so. So start doing stuff like um, std copy. Uh, start doing stuff like, for example, if you are even want to really to make this mem copy there, do static assert like <coughs> is trivially copyable just below your structure as a contract or design intent for this class so everyone will know exactly what, your was, your, what was your intent for this specific structure. If someone breaks it, it just starts to not compile and it will be easy to find out during the code review. So compare time dispatch. This is really cool stuff because this is the dispatch uh, on during, as the name suggests, during, done during compile time. So you don't pay for any runtime branches in for, to generate a code for different use cases. And those use cases in this case will be different categories of, of iterators, yes. So you have advanced, it takes input iterator, distance, and we just call our helper function that will Beside having the arguments of the function in the first, first, first two positions here, we'll also add mm, um, iterator category taken from the iterator traits or of our iterator here. So with that, we can write the overload for input iterator. Uh, for the input iterator can move only forward, so we are doing this in the for loop here, and we just provide an assert to make sure the n was positive or non-negative in this case. For bidirectional iteration, we can move in other way. For random access, we can do it in one step. Yes, and this will always generate a correct code for you. This is called compile and dispatch, and it is as fast as possible without any runtime overhead. So if you will change a container, for example, uh, in your maintenance during some refactoring stuff, the code will still work fine and as fast as possible. You don't have to pay attention and, and review all of the code using it in order to make sure that it's still valid. It's really, really powerful to, to use this approach. And <coughs> that's actually why we started to improve stuff. I mean, it doesn't look like it's an improvement here, uh, but actually we started to provide the um, competent branches inside the function code so we don't have to do tag dispatch. I don't mean that tag dispatch is wrong because it's cool and I still use it, but I want to show you the alternative here, yes? So you can provide the compile time dispatch by if concept, and you can provide is based of random access iterator tag. So you basically verify if this is the, the iterator inherited from specific base. So this is for random access, for bidirectional, and this will be for, for input iterator. But it's, as I said, it's not that user friendly, yes? But C++20 comes, and C++20 provides us the concepts that you are probably aware of already. Concepts are mostly used to, to I thought about people about providing requirements, constraints for template arguments. And you can use them, of course, because these are the, the primary use case for them. But actually, those are binary expressions. You can provide them also in static asserts in that way, or if concept. So with that, it's pretty easy to understand this function. First of all, you have a concept here saying that this template will always take only input iterators which is really good because you already state your intent in the, in the signature of the function because saying temp type name t, uh, yeah, talking about type name t uh, in templates. Actually, type name t in the template is void of C++, if you think about it. It just takes everything. It can take vector, string, it can take my integer or, or any fundamental type here. It just binds with everything during compilation. It will just fail in your face with 200 pages of log saying that something was wrong. But it's basically the void of, of C++. 
And we should, should start thinking about it that way and start to constrain our templates in order to provide better, safer code, easier to use. Okay. And what's actually cool with that is that those constraints are not um, represented in comments or some implementation with static asserts, but they are visible in the signature of the functions. So, so if you go to the, for example, cppreference.com, you will see those constraints in the, 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 the signature of the function. You will know exactly how to work with this function in order uh, to be compatible with the way that author of this interface thought it, uh, invented for this function. So this is much better to communicate the intent between the user and the author. And this is really, really important. This is, we spent a lot of time in C++20 working on features that will make those intents easier so we'll have less wrong usage of functions in our code. So this is concept, say, this input iterator, then you have if concepts for random access, for bidirectional, and this is, of course, the last one for input iterator. Also, a new syntax here is called contract. Uh, this, is not an, this is not a macro, this is a language feature. And the difference is that, um, first of all, macros are wrong. And uh, second stuff is that it will, um, also the compiler will, and static analyzers will take benefit from this, for example, for optimization stuff. So it will, they'll be able to produce better code with, 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 uh, with understanding of contracts. But I will be talking about contracts a bit later when actually there will be more meaningful case for them. So another point where C++ is really fast is that we, we can do a lot of things in compile time, yes? And actually we could do it always from the time where we implemented template metaprogramming. So let's assume that you want to implement uh, or pre-cache some, some data, uh, some results of a function for typical arguments as an input. So probably you have some functions, algorithms in your code that get uh, some typical use cases and you start to optimize for, for them in your code. And for many years we are doing this actually. So let's make our really important and really hard to in, uh, implement function or calculate function a factorial because it's a good academic use case here. And we can do factorial in non-compile time by providing runtime argument and in non-compile time by providing compile time argument here, yes? So in order to work with compile time, and before C++11, we had to do template metaprogramming that looks like this, a bit scary. We had to pro provide a bunch of, of um, class templates and that will implement the feature for you. So it was really powerful in, in its days because it allowed us to, to work in compile time context with the values of such algorithms. So you could use it, for example, as a, as a size of the array here, or you could pre-calculate the array of values that will be known in compile time. And yeah, of course, you cannot use it in the run, with the runtime argument here. And this is always compile time. So actually, it's faster. But actually, for most of us, it was always too hard. And what's wrong here is that you have two separate implementations for that. So actually you can have two separate number of bugs for the same code, yes? So how to make sure that your runtime code and compile time code is consistent? It was hard. So we just chose, in most cases, other language for doing the compile time calculation stuff. It's called Excel. <coughs> yeah, this is the reality. This is how we worked in 90s. We just put everything to Excel, pre-calculated values. And of course, what we did? hard code the results in the, in the code, yes? This is how life w looked some time ago, before C++11. And that's actually probably most of engineers did in their life at once, at least once. I'm not proud of it, but I did it. This was the way to do it at some point, some time ago. So with Consex, it's much easier, yes? You can type the same code uh, for, for runtime and compile time. Uh, so it's pretty easy here, uh, but actually this one is using recursion. In C++11, concepts were uh, specified in the way that, that there was a list like that long saying what you can do in concepts context. So the list of features that you can use there. In C++14, it was extended, and actually right now we have the list of things that you cannot do that is the same long in the concepts context. And uh, but in C++11 you have to do only one expression and do recursion for branching. To have like, like uh, for iteration, sorry, for, for, for iterating for stuff. For branching we use ternary operator to have only one expression. 
And you could actually use it in a combined context, <coughs> like this, or like this, or like this with static asserts, a new feature in C11. Um, you could use with runtime context, like this. But actually, this code uh, with a compile time value here is not guaranteed to run in compile time. It's up to the compiler to decide if, he want, if, it, if it wants to uh, do it in compile time or runtime. If the compiler says or, or, or finds out that it, make, it made your life miserable enough during compilation time already, he will not make it even more so, so he will just decay this for runtime. Uh, but uh, you cannot force it in order to make it compile time. It's just the compiler to decide. With C14, you can write the same code, but you can use the same implementation like in before C11, so typical runtime implementation for it. And the, all other rules are the same. What bothers you about array? For me, people are always saying that, that array is a good replacement for C arrays, and I agree. But always what bothers me that if I have a long array with initializer, I have to count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 15, and provide the 15 number as, an, as, a, as a length of the array, yes, with initializers. It's a, it's a pain. For C, you don't have to do it. With C17, we got class tepper argument deduction guides and class tepper argument deduction feature that actually will make this placeholder type a good array of integers of the size that you provided. So with that, this is exactly the same feature as C array, and it's much safer, and now you don't have any reasons to complain about stood array, and just use it in the code. Um, another useful feature is that for static asserts, we tend to provide really meaningful error messages, because we couldn't just skip those uh, comments here. So we have a lot of comments like error, something happened, or just empty st string here, and we decided it's nonsense, and we allowed user to not provide the information here. You can just keep it in C17. So, talking about C14, if you are stuck on C11, only just this, or this, this feature of being able to write any code for context can be enough if you are doing any calculations in your code, can be enough in order to, to have an agreement to upgrade. Um, because this and generic lambdas make a lot of difference for C14. Actually, this is the biggest difference in the code that, 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 that touches you. So if you are doing a lot of compile time things and you, if you care about the performance, that's probably one of the best arguments to, to fight for. With C20, we can move this assert from here to contract. And contracts are about expressing our design intents, again. But this, th this, this time about, it's about runtime arguments, not compile time arguments. Concepts are about compile time, saying what T you can provide here as a type. Contract is about runtime stuff, so what value you can provide here in runtime in order to pass the criteria of, 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 or the contract or invariance of specific, of specific function. So actually, it doesn't mean that it will be checked every time because it doesn't have to. It just means that you can expect any behavior if you will not obey the contract. So this is basically these are intentions in the code. Andras, do you have a question? If you violate the contract in the context, context, uh, I think you have. A <laughs> Do we have a compile time error for this or not? For, for sure, if you have a, a, a contract that, that throws an exception, then you will have compile time error. But for if you decide to, to, uh, to not have exceptions being used for contracts, I don't remember really. I think this should be compile time error, but maybe not. I'm not sure because I, I spent my time in LEWG. I didn't have still a possibility to, to play with contracts because I didn't get in a compiler that works with this yet, but I think there is a Clang branch with contracts. Maybe on Godbolt somewhere, but I didn't play with it too much. Yeah, but basically this is great because once again you see the DJ intent in the signature of the function. Uh, so you can see again it on cppreference.com, for example, or in the header file of the interface you are just want to use of some library. Yes? Yes, so the question is, can we switch off the, the asserts? Yes, uh, as I said, 
for me, the best feature here is that it just states what is the intent, not about that it's checking anything. Uh, but actually, there are uh, three levels right now that we agree that we should check. There is default. So this is basically this. You can pass expense default or just say expect. It, will mean, it means that it's a default level of, of verification. There is audit saying that it's an expensive, expensive check to do and don't do it in most cases. And there is a course also called something like an axiom, which means that it's so trivial and so something that you should never verify. It's just that author says it should be always true and, and never verify it. And actually we expect that every compiler in its specific implementation, specific way, because it's not standardized, will provide a command line like arguments for DCC, how you want to treat every level of those verifications. And we still, of course, trying to provide some, some common uh, guidelines for this, but right now I know that experts on this domain are, are just arguing what those common uh, implementation or, 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 or common stuff should be here. But yes, you will be able to disable all of the checking in the runtime, even for, for, for default. I assume that by default, by in the compilers, the default will be checked for every build and probably uh, audit will be checked only in debug builds by default. But that's my expe expectation. Uh, we will see how the compiler vendors will implement it. But you will have, a, for sure, you will have always compile time um, switches in order to, to remove them. Um, but why I have two columns here? Because other column is about coming back to compile time only evaluation. Even for C20 with concepts, we are not able to guarantee that this function will run in compile time. And you want to make sure that it does for some cases. If you want to make, ev make sure that our code can run always in compile time evaluation context, we have a new keyword here called constival. Const eval. With constival, our function will always run only in the compile time evaluation context. It also means that this function will never appear in the binary code of our product. So you have, for example, if you have any like really secret argument, like a really secret algorithm that you would, wouldn't like to share even in a binary format with, with customers, then you can pre-calculate everything in the compile time context and provide just value from it results of it in the, in the code. And it will never appear even in the binary. So some, some guys doing some, some like, uh, let's say, uh, sniffing and some, 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 some parts of, of, of the assembly stuff will not be able to, to um, reverse engineer your, your algorithm. But also you can use it in some places where actually you just don't want to bother that this code will be used in runtime. So actually it will work fine, it will work fine, it will work fine, this one too, but this one will never compile because this is for runtime agreement, yes? So actually we just make a very long circle because we just came back again to things that we had with uh, the meta programming stuff. We have two ways to specify the same, yes? We have constext and constival. What's actually good is that constival can use constext functions in the implementation, so you can implement the function once, but actually you cannot overload on those. So you have to provide different name for the constival function. But actually you can reuse the implementation, which is quite nice. And make sure that this function will always run in constant evaluation concept. concept. Okay, so let's move forward to the next case. What this function does, this is code review time. You have like one minute to do a code review because we probably don't care more about doing code review for one function. <coughs> Is it correct? Do you see any bugs? Which one is simpler to do code review? This one or this one? <laughs> this is the creative way, yes? Just think what, just provide the information what you are using, what you are doing, not, not how you are doing this stuff. It's much easier to work with algorithms, much easier to work with declarative syntax. Uh, think about this a lot. And, and, and if you're using 104 loops, if you are scope a lot on, on, on stuff, how you are doing stuff, try to think in a declarative way. Uh, using algorithms is much better. You can make it 
proper, you can unit test it and then reuse it. It's much easier to prove that this code is correct by just reviewing this line in, in five seconds than working with such a code written every time all over again. A lot of people claim that algorithms in satellite library uh, are not good for them because they uh, have different algorithms. But actually, if I ask them to mm, provide me uh, what algorithms they know, they stop on five of algorithms that they know from the satellite library. There are much more of algorithms there. So if you uh, didn't see them, go to the cbpreference.com in algorithm section. You will see like more probably than 100 of algorithms being there. You can do a lot with them. If you cannot, write your own algorithms with the same inter interface, so based on iterators, and just share with your company of if, of if it's a generic one, provide it to the ISO committee for others to use. We'll be happy to, to have more algorithms in the library. But this is really, really beneficial to anyone, everyone. So with that, let's move smoothly to algorithms. So let's implement a get order that will return an iterator to the order for given client ID from, from a range of orders sorted by client ID. So what it means, we have client ID that for sake of this exercise it would be just fundamental type int. Uh, we will have two structures, account and order. Both of them will have client ID as a field called client. And we have a stood vector of order called orders. We have get orders as an expensive, let's say, function that gets something from database or from some XML file, I don't know, but it's expensive function to call. And we have get order and that gets those orders and looks for client ID for orders. So before C++11, you have to provide comparator by yourself. So you have to call, make a functor here with function call operator here for order on the left side, right side, and compare the client IDs, and then sort them using this functor here, object of, of this functor. If you wanted to get order, you why I sort order here? Because I want to use lower bound. In order to use lower bound, I have to make sure that my collection is sorted. It is. So that's why having, I had here sort orders by client ID. And for lower bound, I have to provide other arguments to the functor. I have to provide order and thing that I'm comparing to, so client ID. So I cannot reuse this functor here, I have to create another one. The rule of comparing is exactly the same. I always compare with less, but I have to provide another functor for this specific type of algorithm. And when you try to use it, you do get order on get order, so we get the vector from here. One to three, we have iterator and use it here. And of course, if you would like to work with accounts, so the other structure having client ID, you have to provide two other functors, yes? Which actually may be inconvenient if you have many structures you are working with in a generic code. With C11, you probably know that you can write lambda with such a syntax, which makes the code much simpler and much easier to reason about, sometimes even faster. And um, yeah, for account, you have to provide another two lambdas to work with the same algorithm. With C14, we got another great selling feature of C14 called generic lambdas. So every time you see auto in a, uh, in lambda function like this one, or actually in a function in C20, because we'll have generic functions in C20, if you see auto as an argument, it means it's a template parameter. This one and this one, and those actually are uh, maybe two different types. So basically these are T and U for our call operator. So we have two generic lambdas to get, uh, to compare by client ID and to get by client ID. So uh, they are for both cases, for sorting and for lower bound. And actually those lambdas will work correctly also with account structure because they will generate the code good for orders here and for accounts here, everything will, everything will work fine as long as the field is named with the same name, client, like here. So that's cool. But let's see what C20 brings us. With C20 you provide only one template function, no, sorry, lambda function here. You provide here lambda function called projection. 
with projection you say how to let's say cast or how to get some data from another structure so basically this projection says that we will convert anything here because we see auto here to client id so the presentation is trivial we just get this anything and get the client field from this structure and with that we can use ranges sort and ranges less and two client id projection here so you can see that we just split information how we get data and how we compare the data to two different tools here so we can reuse actually implemented comparators already we don't have to implement our own comparator operators like, like for less greater or maybe you have some your custom operators for, for comparison and what we are comparing and actually this is exactly the same for both for sorting and for lower bound we don't have to provide two different implementation anymore and we use it of course we also want to work with account also you can see here that i provided a contract in this get order function saying that we expect in audit level so it's expensive check but it's good to state that the orders here should be sorted with less yes because this is assumption of our function that will be work cor working correctly so first of all if you see this code in cppreference.com you will know exactly that this function uses lower bound in the implementation probably or any other algorithm working with sorted containers and you have to provide sorted um, collection to it because in this implementations if you look on the implementation in the header file you will not know about it and you can provide any collection here even if there is like another function um, just one up ab ab above it in the header file called sort orders by client id you will not know that you have to call this function first and then pass the results to this one because there is no information about it maybe in comments This is not checked by the compiler, this is runtime code. No, but that this mm -hmm. those ranges is Ah, okay, yeah. So the yeah, the compiler will always verify if this expression uh, can be compiled like a normal code. It will never generate this function actually, it will never call this function, but it has to compile fine. So it means that you there's no possibility to have like outdated arguments like it's in case of of, of comments for functions. So it always has to be up to date, it always has to, have to compile fine, uh, so be updated, even if it's not checked. But of course you can run some debug builds when you will be checking things like this in order to make sure that everyone obeys the rules. So this is again one thing that changes a lot, a lot of functions that you, can, that you have right now in your production code to make it safer and easier to use. By the way, did you spot that you have a bug on the slide? Yeah. Yes. Last line. Last line, exactly. So we have orders returned from get orders, yes, by R value here, so temporary. And we have this get order function, and we call it this way. So we provide, provide here get orders, we get a temporary from it, we, we look for one to three, we get an iterator to it. After that, vector dies. And we did a friend iterator, yes? But good catch. Uh, yeah. So we have a bug here. And what we can do about it? Uh, actually, if you would use, uh, instead of get orders, you would just use plain algorithm here in the code, you will get a compile time error. Because this is how Eric Nibler designed the library. He's a really smart guy. Uh, in order for us to be s the same smart, we have to actually start to work with templates here, which may not be the, uh, the happy face smile on most of developer faces, but actually uh, it makes a lot of difference here because we have to provide information to the lower bound algorithm what is the type of the collection here, if it's L value or R value. And you can, you can do it right now only with templates. So we provide here a template saying that we want to have forward range as an argument here and perfect forward this range to this algorithm. So this is only needed when you do wrappers around algorithms because if you be using algorithms plainly in this code, you don't have to care about it at all. And with that, you have such a compile time error. 
saying that there is no match for operator star in something strangely named ranges dangling. Ranges dangling is a really strange type that can construct from anything and doesn't have any operations inside. It just represents dangling uh, object in the code. And it will be dangling for error values of containers. Because it's smart enough to know that if, it, if it's an error value of a reference type, like let's say span or string view or maybe some view, it doesn't care because if the view dies, the original data is still there, so iterator is stable and you can use it. So it's really, really smart piece of code here. So in order to make it work, you have to um, make an L value for orders and pass L value to get order functions and then it just works fine because it returns the iterator instead of dangling type and everything is fine. So this is, these are the features that we are looking for heavily in order to make the code easier to write, easier to use. If you'll be playing with algorithms by yourself, it will just work. But if you want to wrap them, remember that you may need a template in order for those features to work for you. Talking about the ranges, let's print the age of the first n adult persons in any range of persons. So let's assume that our structure person has two strings, name and age. Now these are strings because they, I don't know, they are taken from XML or JSON or any other string, str streaming operation and there was no uh, string to int operation done yet on age. So we have vector of person called people and we have function, print age of first n adults, let's say 10 of them. So this is how you plan this in C++ to 98. You just write a for loop uh, for all of the range of people, uh, convert the uh, integer to ASCII, ASCII to integer with 8OE, and get C style string for it, compare if, if the person is adult, break it, if it's um, already more than n elements, print it and print it otherwise. Easy, yes? But lower bound probably is easier to analyze than this one by name. And actually this one will not work with C arrays, so it's not the generic even though it's a template, because this four will, will not find like a begin in a C array, yes. With C++11, we have an improvement here because we can use range-based for loop, which actually will work with C arrays here. And actually with static asserts, we can look for precondition on this function, on the type of it, uh, easily, by verifying, for example, if our container, because we, can, we take everything here, we can take string here, we can take int here, we can take vector here, everything will get here. This is type name T. Uh, the name doesn't matter here, yes? It's just name input range, but it can be anything. You can pa pa pass just integer or double here. So actually we are doing here a contract, con concept verification. If actually data here is a range of persons by playing with iterator traits and a lot of strange other things like type traits. But the implementation is similar. And the change here is that we also received an uh, S2I that works with strings, so we don't have to use all of this uh, uh, POSIX interface anymore from, from C. With C17, we have a small change here that actually we have variable templates used for, for type traits, so it gets a bit simpler. And also, we got really performant conversions from characters to integers and back with functions called from chars and to chars. If you are doing conversions of, of strings to integers and back, use those functions. Those are the fastest functions, the fastest generic functions that will work for, for, for your conversions. So if you're working with any text, these are the fastest one you can use, C17. Can we use algorithm for this for loop in order by not destroying the performance of it? Can you imagine this? How we can reuse this range based for loop and use algorithm here for the same with the same performance? And then yes, transform maybe or something. And element. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so we can also try to use copy, yes. However, this is not that trivial because for most of the cases we are thinking about here right now, we should allocate the vector of integers to, 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 to pass the data from, from, from s2i or to int and then analyze it later on. So you have to do some, some, uh, some allocation of the, of the output for, for most of the containers. And it may be a performance issue here, so it's not easy just to re-implement every for loop with algorithm. Yes, not everything is possible, but for this, ranges come here to our playground. Uh, let's see how we can implement the same code if C++20. With C++20, first of all, we can make this contract here, concept here, much easier to type. We just say that we require that the range value of R because it's an input range in this case, so it cannot be double anymore. This in range value of R is the same as person. So we are making sure that our container is the container of persons. We don't care what is the type of the container, but we know that it's working with persons. So we are already fine here. Another thing is that we are using std ranges here, or probably I shouldn't have two using namespaces here. And we provide two lambdas, uh, the projection, so to age, so how to convert from person to age. And we provide another comparator here. What does it mean for a person to be ad adult? Yes, here. And look here in this for loop. This for loop takes people, then transform this in a lazy way to age. So we are not working here with container of ints, we're just working with one int because this is lazy evaluation. Then we are filtering only adults and then taking on the first n elements and then printing this on the screen. This is much, much easier to type, much easier to analyze, much easier to maintain than the code in previous slides. And as fast as possible without any overhead. Except compile time. Except compile time, yes, but I'm pretty sure that this will improve. When, when the compilers will learn those tricks from ranges. But actually, templates are not the slowest things that you can do. Overload resolution is. So, so if you are always blaming templates for slow compilation, <coughs> this is not the case in most cases. Overload resolution is the killer for performance. We'll be talking about this maybe a, bit, a, little, a, bit, a little bit later. So another use case. If you're having any wrapper types, like per, like optional, or other wrappers in your, in your libraries, in your corporations. Uh, it's sometimes good to consider how you can construct such, such, a, such, such a wrapper. For example, if you have a pair of two strings, you would really like to be able to initialize this with two C, 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 C literals, like this one, and not have to type a string every time as a, in a constructor here, or yeah, suffix maybe, maybe with UDL may be good here easier, but we don't have user-defined literals for every type. But basically, you would like to have implicit conversion being done in this case, but really, you probably wouldn't like to have the, the this to compile fine. Vector has a constructor with one integer, but if this code would compile fine, you would be in a big problem, yes? So how to write a wrapper type that can work as nice for such types, but also to prevent such usage for such types. The same code, yes, the same container. For this, in, from C11, we are doing this in this long way. We provide a feature called, we are using Sphina for overload resolution here. Sphina is a resolution failure, it's not an error. And we are doing this typically with enable if type traits from the standard library. And uh, basically two cases are here the same, so, um, T has to be constructable from U, but in first case, it has to be convertible uh, from, from U, and in second case, it's, it cannot be convertible from U. So here we have implicit conversion, here we have explicit conversion, and we have to retype implementation of this constructor twice. It's not user-friendly, yes? And it's not the easiest type of things to type, that's probably we are never doing this in our corporation code. You can find the code like this in the standard library, you can find the code like this in the boost library, but probably if you have any wrapper types in your code, I'm pretty sure it's not written that way. 
because this is not the thing that we would like to play with as users, yes. With spell 14, we have a small improvement of having this underscore T, which makes it a bit easier because we, we don't have to type type it here and type it then. With 17, we got V, but it's still the same code to type. With 20, we have quite a few improvements here. You can use contra and concepts here. Concepts will be uh, implemented in a specific way that we have um, uh, something called more specified or more, or more constrained concept that will have priority over less constrained concept. So basically this has four constraints, it has two constraints, so this is more constrained, so this has, will have priority. So if this, all of this is true, this one will be run, otherwise this one will be run. So it's less to type already. But there's still a lot of things to type. So with C++20 we also have explicit as, a, as an operator, like consex, for example, or no except. Uh, so here you have a is convertible uh, from u to t, and with this you can implement, provide only one implementation for the constructor, and with that it starts to be pretty simple for everyone to use in, in the corporation code too, in order to provide this feature. It's already not that hard, especially that you provide only con contracts here, you have to play with Fina by yourself. Okay, we have like probably four to five more use cases, so bear with me, I know it's a bit late. Uh, let's implement custom string like type uh, that, uh, and make it constructable from, from C structure, from, 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 from C string here. So you can use, choose any implementation, you can choose even some such silly one as here, for example to implement case sensitive comparison here. But if you want to write any regular type, you have to pass all of those operators by yourself. This is really easy to do, and that's why most of the bugs are hidden here. Because we don't, we don't care, we, don't, uh, we are not careful here. It's just too easy to make an error, right? So we do a lot of copy-paste errors. I've seen so many copy-paste errors in such a code. It's really easy to make an error in all those comparison stuff. And you have to type it many times. With C20, a new feature comes called Starship Operator. And with this, you will be able to write only those two. You provide how to compare CI string with other CI string and how to compare with constructor star. And it will work both for left and right hand argument because I did not say explicitly this, but you have the same presentation here for right argument and left argument, yes? So you have to type it twice. Here you type it only once, and it will be done for both. Yes, question? Actually, this time it's hard to compare that you're, um, you're required to, to implement them as uh, two functions, and also starship, you're doing the member functions? Yeah, so uh, the question is, should there be member functions or non-member functions? Uh, the generic... Uh, think here is that there should be non-member functions, so there should be a friend here in this case. And this is a really good question because this is about the killer that I wanted to tell you about, tell about you, tell, tell for you. So basically I wanted to tell about the overload resolution rules, yes. So overload resolution is the slowest process and actually if you will type it that way or if you will type as a non-member without friend, you will pay a lot for overload resolution in order to happen. I try to make an error in like uh, operator equals equals or operator like streaming, so, so less less, and see how long the error is for your code. And, and then like include five or 10 <coughs> standard library headers and, and, and try it again. You will see how the overload resolution uh, starts to explode in your code. And it makes your code really slow because there are a lot of functions a lot of that can match operator equals equals or, or, or less less in, in your code. And if you are doing this either as a member or non-member, uh, it will just exp make another use case for, for, for checking for our resolution. The solution here is to make it friend. If you make it friend non-member function, it will be uh, it will be excluded from the overload resolution for other types, 
and actually the, this, the overload resolution set for this type will be limited only to a friend function. So it just makes it really, really fast. So if you have a lot of operators, overload, of overloading operators in your code or, code or functions like swap, so it's so things that makes the overload resolution big for a specific, for a specific name, just make it friend, even if you don't care, even, even if you don't need friend for, for access. It will just make your code much, much faster to compile. Really. Just adding a friend to, to op overload operators is a really good way to, to improve the compile times of, of your code. It, this feature is called hidden friends, by the way, if you'll be looking for it on the internet. So, talking about strings, one more example here. We want to implement a simple string view that will work with, with below code. So the code here is that we have two string views, Alabama, Mississippi, and we want to print the uh, common number of, of elements, first elements that, that are um, matching the length of both the arguments. So basically, we probably want to uh, print all of these things until this i. So we have a for loop that iterates from the beginning of the first function, from first string, a second string, compares if it's not ended, and increment stuff, and print it. So this is how you can type it. This is string view, it has a const iterator here, it has some really easy step to do, so the, con the constructors here, uh, everything is const, everything is no except, and that's pretty easy to implement the same as to, to implement the const iterator. But actually, I don't mean about the implementation, I mean that we have a bug on the slides. And this bug is from the very beginning. So the comma shouldn't be and or something? Yes, exactly. Good question and a good comment from the audience. This comma is a bug here. I don't know how many of you spotted it, but during code review, it's really easy to miss it. This should be and n or any other operator here, yes. Comma is just an error. And actually, this comma was found by um, Windows developers in their core of the, of, of the Windows core libraries. And how did they found it? Not with code reviews. They made thousands or hundreds of code reviews on those functions in the core libraries, and they never found it. How they found it? They started to work with something. You probably are aware of terms like always, always auto or context, all the things. Now we are talking about no discard all the things. If you will implement, uh, like extend your implementation with null discards for nearly every function that returns something, here and here, you will get a compile time error saying that you are ignoring the return value of, 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 of this operator here. And that's really another good suggestion. If your function returns something and it shouldn't be ignored or typically it will not be ignored, just put no discard there. And actually, probably 90 to 95 percent of functions, even in standard library, should be marked as no discard. And we probably will, will be starting doing this for C++ 23. There are some functions that can return something that cannot be, be or doesn't have to be verified, like for example, iterator from vector and place operation. In most cases, you don't care when where the element were insert, was inserted, but these are only exceptions. In most cases, every, even such dummy operation like this one can be used in a bad, in a bad way. <coughs> and that's why it's really good to write no accepts here. And that leads us to another pain point of C++, and right now I don't know really how to fix it. Uh, see how much of this, of this slide is code, and how much of these are qualifiers and, and, this big, and, and some other helpers here, specifiers. No discard, context. No except, uh, explicit, and other stuff. We have all those defaults wrong in the language. And actually, there is no good idea right now how to make it work. I hope it will be possible with modules, but for sure not for C20. I would really love to have something like specifying, like in the mo module pre preamble, to say something like language C23, which I didn't, I wouldn't like to have another dialect of the language. But I would love to have exactly the same language created by the compiler, but just to put the defaults for me. So I mean the same AST tree in the compiler after processing my file, but I don't have to type all of this. 
I just mean that my module will have no discard, consex, no excel by default. And of course, we have to provide the opposite tags for, for specific use cases there, like say implicit for constructor or may discard. <laughs> but actually, it would be much less to type because most of the function functions should have no discard there. We just don't put it there because we are lazy. And we'll be ending, once again, we'll end up in a much better place with such feature. But for now, it's really missing for me. Okay, so we probably have like two or three more use cases here. One of them is how you write your good uh, containers in your libraries, in, in your corporations. Uh, if you are working with policy-based design uh, for your templates, then it's really common just to not care about the size of the policy. Even if it's empty, you often pay for the size of it. So if you have a, like a hasher, predicate, allocator, deleter, I don't care what's, what's the container here, and it's empty, uh, in most cases you pay for the size of it at least for one byte because you have to increment the address. And there is also some padding going there, so it's even more in most cases. So uh, a good implementation should use so-called empty base optimization, which is actually a hack, but it works. And, and in order to implement this, you have to create a class template that actually is not implemented for the generic case. So the primary template is not implemented. The parameter here, use EBO, so use empty base optimization, is true where our type T is not final because it doesn't have sense to implement, to inherit from the final class. And it also doesn't have sense to uh, use EBO if the class is not empty. So it will be true if the class is non-final and is empty. So this is true type, tr true case here for specialization of the primary template. So if we are using empty base optimization, we are inheriting from T. Uh, and other case, if it's false, we are using T as a member, just as, a, as an aggregation. And the rest of the code is pretty trivial. So here we are just initializing base class or the member, or we are returning here in get, we are returning pointer to this because it's exactly the same as the pointer to T, or here we are returning T as a member. It's pretty easy helper. You can just copy paste it and use it in your code for, for containers, but it's still a hack. In order to use it, you inherit privately, not publicly, but privately because this is implementation detail from EBU helper for hash, predicate, allocator, deleter, or whatever you have as a policy. And with that, you will not pay for size if this is empty and non-final. But it's a lot of code in order to achieve the, the, some specific outcome from it. So we actually introduced C++ 20. We introduced just an attribute called no unique address here. And you don't have to play with, with EBO helpers or, or with uh, private inheritance here anymore. You are just saying, these are my policy classes, and if they are empty, I will never take an address to those members, so please compiler assign the same address to all of them. All of them. So you will not pay for any address here. And I'm pretty sure the compilers will generate an error if you will try to get an address to those. But I'm not sure. I didn't check it because it's not implemented yet, I think. At least I didn't play with a compiler that has it yet. And the last use case for, for, for today. How many two string operations did you write for your enumeration types? Or how many uh, is an invalid enumeration function did you write for, 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 for validation if an input from user or some network protocol or anything that provides you integers is an element of the, of the enumeration? I'm pretty sure that you have probably more, more than 100 in your, in your production code of functions to string or functions to uh, like, like is valid enumeration. We just do it so often. So this is an example of a fruit that has apple, banana, orange, and this is how we can validate stuff. We can also, in a similar way, make it to string with some switch statement. If, if you are uh, good developers, you should do a switch statement without default. Default is really wrong in this case. If you don't have default, the compiler can provide you information that actually your list is not full if you will main, like, uh, extend this list later on during maintenance. So this is the use case, good use case, but we are writing so, such so many functions of those. With C++ hopefully 23, we'll have reflections in the language. With reflections, you'll have probably syntax similar to this one. 
saying that you have a, is one of enumerators or two string for enumerator. You want to make sure that your type name T here called enum is actually an enum. So you write something like this one for contact con concepts. And actually the other type is integral. And then you have new syntax here that may change because it's still you know, standardized, like for concept. So you'll be basically able to make a for loop over a concept container. You will do reflex, that will be a new operator on any type that will return you the uh, structure with compiled information about the type. You'll be able to get enumerators, which will be compiled times to the vector that will allocate more in compile time and free it in compile time. And you'll be able to iterate it over during compile time. And then you will be able to get the value of the numerator or a user string from for its name, or either print it for to string or compare it with value to validate it. And that's all. The compiler will know exactly how it works. And, and probably it will be sure should also be const eval, not const exp here. The body of this function probably will, no, sorry, it should be const exp, not const eval. Um, because it has to be in, implemented in, in for, 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 uh, for runtime. So it will be const exp. But compiler will know all of the cases here. We'll know how many enumerators are on the list. So we will make all of the tricks for you in order to make it fast. So it doesn't, probably it will not be a for loop. It will be like, um, like the just, uh, loop unrolling being done here if, if it's valid or, or branches, switches and other stuff depending on the values and number of enumerators here. So it will be as fast or faster than you could ever implement and you have to implement it only once in such an easy way. No more writing two strings by yourself. So this is where the language heads right now. For Stata 23, we expect also some other new uh, cool stuff like pattern matching, for example, and probably other things too. So, as a summary, as I said, C++11 was a huge, huge difference for all of the, the community and, and production in our in our C++ world. It was just a like a game changer. It changed, it changed really things like how we think about the code and how we write the code. And but also it was totally different from C++ 98. That's why it was so expensive to move to C++ 11. That a lot of companies last, like were afraid of the results of this and don't want to move forward to 14, 17, which actually pretty simple steps because there are not many changes. Everything is compatible, and you have some pretty nice helpers there. For 14 and 17, those are important, by, but less important. Uh, important, but less, uh, um, let's say, groundbreaking features. So we have things like uh, extensions to concepts, so we can write it in more user-friendly way. We have uh, generic lambdas in 14. For 17, I mostly think that. Uh, it's string view, optional, and variant that changes how you think about the language. But, but those, all, those are library stuff. You can find them anyway on GitHub, probably, or from some other folks that implemented those, or in Boost. Uh, other features like fold expressions, or, or class temporary reduction stuff, or structure bindings, I don't think about them as really important features that you can use like every day in your work. But C20 is going to be huge. Really, it will change the market probably even more than C11 did. Think that every function template or class template can be constrained with right now and should be constrained with, with a concept right now. Uh, if your functions do not have strong types in their arguments, so basically because you can provide contracts, the best way to provide contracts is by strong type EQ arguments. But if you're using a lot of fundamental types, for example, or your, your, your types are not strong enough, then you need contracts in order to provide those in, let's say, uh, like more verbose way to say what you can pass to this function. And it will also change a lot of functions with contracts. And there are a lot of other features. We even didn't speak at all about the modules today. We didn't speak about coroutines today. Really, those will change a lot of things that we are right now doing right now in our code. 
So C++ 20 is going to be really game changer again, even bigger than C++ 11 was in my opinion. So start preparing for it, do not stay behind. Uh, and probably that's, that's all from me. Do you have any? Yeah, so if you don't want to stay behind, hire me or other trainers <laughs> out there because it's really important sometimes to hire a guy that will say exactly the same that you are talking to your management, but it will be a guy from side saying the same and it sometimes can work better or just to, 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 to explain something to you or, or other guys in your company. And so it's really important to, to, to move forward. If you are looking for some tricks, how to speak with management about, about upgrades, uh, how to make it run for your company, please contact me. You can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, I have some visit cards here. You can find me on my website so, or any other conference. I'll be on Meeting C++ probably this year too. So we'll, we'll be in touch. It's a small world. Thank you. <laughs> Do you have other, any other questions? You had quite a bunch. Yes. Um, have you ever uh, had the situation that the vendors don't implement one of the features that you, the new standard provides? So, uh, do we have a cases where vendors do not, do not implement the features? Yes. You mean the compiler vendors? Yeah, so you propose, you propose like, okay, then we will use the uh, contract or whatever. And then uh, the new C++ decide that, okay, I'm not going to implement this feature. Uh, I don't think it happens often, basically because all of the developers of those compilers are the ones that are voting in for this feature. So if they would be complaining hard about some feature, we'll, we'll be listening to them because actually, let's say the compiler authors have a lot of respect in our community and if they are saying that it's something is stupid or, or hard, we, we, are all, we always listen. Uh, however, some features are less important or, or more expensive to, compile, to, to implement. That's why, for example, we didn't have too many uh, execution policies being implemented yet for our algorithms, even though it's C++ 17. I don't know how many compilers are shipping with full uh, range of the algorithms with, for parallel algorithms, but I think there are really, this still feature is really waiting to be implemented. There are two possibilities. Either it's really complicated, or we know that this feature will suck without executors, but we are waiting for C++20 for it to happen, but executors will not happen in C++20 uh, because actually they were not ready. So I think we'll have to wait for 23. Otherwise, I don't think about other features that were just ignored for so many, so much, so, so long. Uh, the, the thing that bothers me maybe in this, in this domain is just uh, the TSS, technical specifications, are being ignored for too, long, for too long. Like for example, concepts right now are implemented only by one compiler in a, in a, in a, in a re release version. Yes, and this is technical specification I think for four years right now. And we knew that it's a good feature, so I would expect those to be more popular and, and widespread before the standard actually ships it. GCC has concepts from, from version 7, I think. So if you're working with GCC 7, actually you can use concepts TS already. And I know a lot of, uh, quite a few corporations that are doing this in production already for concepts TS. So if you're if you're using only GCC for your product, you don't have to, and you don't like um, make it portable to Windows or, or, or Clang, then you can go with concepts already. They are really similar to what we will have in standard. So you will just re later reuse the same code for standard version. Also, please go to, to, to libraries like Date from Howard Hinnan on GitHub. I really recommend you going there if you're playing with Date. And if you are stuck for on C++14, you can find probably this implementation of Optional on Andrzej Krzemiński's uh, GitHub because he is the author of it. You can find pretty nice uh, variants on either Micropark or, or uh, Anthony Williams repositories so you can actually play with those uh, let's say good 
uh, uh, types from C++ 17 already. If there are no other questions, thank you again. Yes? Uh, you mentioned the uh, Int Machine Library uh, at the beginning of Oops. Uh, I didn't hear what the name is. Which one? State machine, yes, I don't remember right now, but I'm pretty sure that Chris Yushak had, had the talk about it on C++ now. I, I know that there are at least three in Boost, so I don't want just to right now make the, like, 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 like quote the, 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 the wrong one. But Chris Yushak is, is, is the author of it, and it had a really, really nice talk on C++ now this, this year. So you'll find the information about the state, state machines implementations there. Uh, if it's complicated and, and, and a quite big machine, machine, probably yes. If it's really small stuff, I, I can I, I work with, for example, Variant really successfully. Okay. You can find my talk actually about Variant on CppCon, for example. Yes? Yeah, there is a library called Magic Enum, and actually you can do a lot of stuff. That, that I, I spoke about reflections here, and it's a pretty cool library. I never actually I never work with it, but already some guys said that, that it's really really nice. So probably it is, and it, it can do some stuff for you, like, like making to string. It's not a portable code because it works with, with, with internal details of the compiler, but actually if you don't want to retype this to string, then then probably yes, it is the one to, to go for. Um, but, but of course, reflections have more wider audiences on an example here. Um, yes? I don't, I don't want to abuse, but uh, talking about uh, libraries, so I wonder, I'm curious, what's the relationship between Boost and the standard C++? I mean, many of the features that came with C++11 were already implemented in Boost, the pointers or something. Uh, what, what happened? Uh, you absorb the code of Boost, it's a complete new implementation. Yeah, so basically, but really, really yeah, so basically the question is what is the, the relation between Boost and C++ standard library? Uh, basically, Boost for many years was an incubator and, and uh, some uh, we get a lot of user experience and implementation experience from, from, from that library. So. Uh, a lot, as, as, as you already mentioned, C++11 and next versions I got the best parts of boosts already to the language. So we have a lot of types like smart pointers, we have variant, we have optional, all of this started to work and, and happen actually in boost. And, and, and thank you boost for this one of course and the, all, the in, in, all, all of the implementers there and, and, the, and developers. But actually with that it turns out that boost right now has a lot of issues. Because what's left there is either some legacy stuff that no one wants to, to, to update. For example, there are a lot of auto pointer like usages or were lately. So, and auto pointer will not compile on C17. So we can say that Boost even doesn't compile with the latest compilers properly. And there are also some experimental stuff or, or really like, like, like narrow domain stuff that will not be used by, by many developers. And actually, I know that Boost developers, we had a lot of discussions about this on C++ now are having a lot of, mm, like, having a problem how to exist in current market and how to extend the library in order for people to use it. Because like before C++11, it was a mandatory library that every developer had it on, on, on its machine at that time. Because without Boost, you couldn't do nearly anything in, a, in an effective way. Right now, most of the users don't have it on their machines because it's not needed anymore. And and this prob it's probably it's not, it's, not, it's not right, and we are thinking how to, how to change it. First of all, probably quite a few features that are going straight to the library right now should go with Boost code review and, and some user, get some user experience from users earlier, but it will make the process longer. So we have to find out how to work with it correctly. But, but yes, right now it's really hard to find out how to use Boost and, and how to extend it, and if there is any worth to you right now using. If you are like using any, some narrow domain stuff, like, like for example, fin state machines, and you have to use it, you will use Boost for that. But for smart pointers, for, for things like, uh, like file system, 
that is generic for all of the users, you don't have to use it anymore. And please don't just use Boost because there is a command line argument parser. <laughs> because it's probably not the best reason to, to, to import all of the Boost there. Okay, thank you very much.